Good evening. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Let us share together in our greeting. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. Let us pray. And let us pray together the prayer that is found in your hymnals on page 353 as we pray together. O oh God, maker of everything and judge of all which you have made, from the dust of the earth you have formed us, and from the dust of death you would raise us up. By the redemptive power of the cross, create in us clean hearts and put within us a new spirit that we may repent of our sins and lead lives worthy of your calling through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Beloved, let us hear our first scripture for this evening, taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word. But by the open statement of truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, and also ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is by God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us stand and sing our opening hymn, To God Be the Glory. We will sing verses 1 and 2, hymn 98. Let us stand and sing.
our prayer of confession found in your hymnals on page 785, the traditional Psalm 51. Let us share together. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done that which is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless in your judgment. Behold, you desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Make me hear with joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Deliver from me, O death, O God, God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. For you have no delight in sacrifice. Were I to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Will you pray with me? O oh, gracious God, may you add your blessing to the reading and the hearing and the living out of your word to us this day. And may we offer our praise unto you this night in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I want to uh, first just say a word of thanks for this opportunity to bring a word from God, from God's word, and for us to gather around the scriptures tonight and to receive this big ball of mess on our forehead. And you are bold to come out on this night to get this on your forehead, but not as bold as those who went to this at 6 a.m. this morning and who got their blob on their forehead and then wore it all day. And I'm sure you have had that experience. I remember doing that at Duke Divinity. I guess this was 1999. And I received my glob on my forehead, the big mark. I, it wasn't even a pretty cross. It was just a big mess. And uh, early in the morning, and then all day, and I went over to... Mean Jeans Cheeseburgers. If you remember that, that was where McDonald's is now in the student union. And I went over there to order my cheeseburger, and she said, Sir, you, you, you've got something on your forehead. <laughs> I said, Yes, yes, I know. 
So it is a, an honor to, to be here tonight. I thank Pastor Laura for allowing me to, to, to bring a word. I think I'm going to get by without my spectators, but you know that optometrist was right. He said, when you get into your 40s, you're going to have that weird time where you, you won't be able to read with your contacts. And he was right. So I think I'm going to be okay. <laughs> Amen. So I wanted to uh, just set up the scripture as we continue in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and set this up a little bit before I read the other parts of chapter 4. You know, as I have lived the Christian life as best as God allows me, I guess, to live or as best as I can by God's grace, I have come to appreciate more and more the Bible as the Word of God. The, the mysterious Word of God. Not that it's exactly understood one-to-one -one and I can just read something and then it automatically happens the way that it says, but that's by God's design that He's still speaking to us and He is relating to us through His Word captured in the Bible. We, His creatures, he is speaking to us, his creatures, made in his image, according to his likeness. And so there's already a, a DNA connection there at the beginning. Even if we're not a Christian, even if we're not going to church, we're all created in the image of God, according to God's likeness. In the context of God's creation. It's always in the context of the larger creation, that God spoke the world into existence. He spoke to this big clod of dirt that He created, three rocks from the sun, and He spoke life into existence. The animals, the plants, the waters, the air, and then human beings. I've come to appreciate more that God is speaking to us through His Word. Life instruction, judgment, guidance, redemption, and encouragement. That God always wants to talk. God always wants to talk with us. You know, I, I've come also to experience, you know when people really don't want to talk with you. Especially after they say, oh, it's so great to hear from you. And then you actually have something you want. And they say, oh, you know, I'm so sorry. I just remembered I've got a meeting. Have you ever been one minute managed? We live in such a fast-paced world. And, and I appreciate that God always has time to talk. The Bible is God's love letter to us here on Valentine's Day. We are reminded that God loves us and he has written us a love letter, not just a card with a pre-printed message, but a God who has written that word from his heart, even in blood. And to think that many, sadly, never even open the envelope. God's unrequited love, you might say. Have you ever had your love spurned? And so this privilege to comment on God's word. And Paul's gospel ministry. Paul's gospel ministry. It is amazing. And as I think about Paul, and as I read and study about Paul, I'm just amazed at how he did this mad dash across the Greco-Roman world. And with tireless energy, he started churches, church after church. Where did he get this power? Where did he get this power? He not only started the churches, 
but he communicated with them and he dealt with them and he labored in love with them through all of their troubles and their imperfections and their fusses and their fights. And there's, there's no other church other than the Corinthian church where he had the most trouble. In fact, we have two letters to the Corinthians. Actually, Paul, as the scholars have pointed out, we actually have four. Because Paul refers to a previous letter he wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians. So that was the first letter. It's been lost to us. Then our 1 Corinthians is his second letter. And then our 2 Corinthians is his third letter. And then there's even a, another letter that is referred to. How did he do this? And he not only started churches, but he delivered a gospel. This gospel of Jesus Christ to Jews and Gentiles, a Christ that they expected but did not fully understand would come through a cross. They were expecting the high and mighty Davidic Messiah who would ride in and lead God's people to redemption and to liberation. And so Paul even had to explain this And the veil that he talks about in the scripture tonight is actually explained in chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians. About how God was going to veil his people for a time and then bring us all back together in Christ. And so we have now the rest of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Starting with verse 7. Some of the most beautiful words in literature of all time. The first verse, verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, clay jars, our bodies. So that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Verse 16, so we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How did Paul do it? How did Paul do all of that? How, where did he get the stamina where did he get the strength? I mean, pastoring one church would be enough. Just starting one church. And, and, and in a world, in a port city like Corinth, that was full of the world, you know, those port cities, they see it all. You want to see the world, just go to a port city and just sit there. It'll come. Boat after boat. Culture after culture, people after people, language after language. They hear it all. They, even, they hear all the good and all the bad. They hear, they, and they will hear a few curse words. I learned what it means to curse like a sailor. Have you ever heard that? He curses like a sailor. You think, oh, that means he curses every other sentence, right? No, that's not what, the, that's the Marines. <laughs> that's the Marines. They, they curse every other sin. No, just kidding. 
Here's what curse, every, uh, curse like a sailor means. A sailor goes around the world and learns the languages, learns a, picks up a little bit of the language in all parts of the world. And so they learn the curse words in all the different languages of the world. Laura knows. Laura knows, see, growing up in South America. <laughs> no, 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 not that she uses them. <laughs> but when she hears our Hispanic friends, you know, talking, and they think, oh, she doesn't understand what I'm saying, and they're using those words, you know, she, she hears them. And she's heard them in Mexico and Venezuela and Argentina. And they have slightly different words that they use. Paul knew the world. It's amazing. But he was also a Hebrew. As he says, I was, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I have followed the law. And he says, in 2 Corinthians, and I wrote this down so I could find it, 11, 2 Corinthians 11, Verse 22, he's talking, he's defending himself because, see, the, the Jewish Christians have come out to say, now wait a minute, Paul, about this gospel, and give him a little, little challenge. And he says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I'm talking like a madman. I am a better one with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless floggings, and often near death. Five times I have received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked for a night and a day. I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, Danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers and sisters, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, hungry and thirsty, often without food, cold and naked. And besides other things, I am under daily pressure because of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble, and I am not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. He says in verse 12, that famous line, For my strength is made perfect in my weakness. So where did Paul get the power? Well, he tells us he got it from God. He got that power, that vision, that courage, that confidence, that strength from God and not from himself. Not in his own strength. He realized upon encountering God in Christ that any and everything that God would accomplish in this fallen world, God would be the power and not through our own strength and abilities. Now sure, God uses our strength, our abilities. That's why He gave us those abilities. He gave us the abilities to grow food and cook and prepare and make clothes and, and, and make shelter. He wants us to do that. Otherwise, what would we do all day? Probably just, you know, be on our devices. 2,000 years ago, it wasn't an iPad, but it was probably something. You know, they say that idleness is the devil's workshop. The novelist Steinbeck says in, in uh, the, the novel East of Eden, he's talking about uh, Cain and Abel, but through two Confederate soldiers, or the so two sons of a Confederate soldier, he says, why, are the mil why is the military always polishing their boots and polishing their belt buckle and, you know, fixing everything just right? Because when you're active duty, you have a lot of free time on your hands. Now, you work hard, but you have a lot of free time on your hands. And when you're deployed, we have Marines on a ship. They have a lot of free time on that ship. 
and your mind will just, you, you, won't, you won't survive unless you've got something to do. And so God knows what He's doing when He gives us this work. But it's for another purpose. It's for the survival of, of humanity and for us. But we are not to rely totally on our own strength and abilities. As talented and as brilliant as we can be, Paul had those abilities. And he, had, he was a brilliant communicator of a highly demanding message. How, how many of us could write a letter and it be read 2,000 years later by billions of people every week? I mean, Paul is quite an author. But he realized even through that that the power comes from God and not from himself. And when we know that, and when we trust in God working through us and not in our own strength, we can, be, we can have less anxiety. If it's only by the grace of God that we go, then it is only by the grace of God that we go. And we can relax about having to look just right or to be just right or say everything just perfectly. Kind of like at a wedding, you know, where everybody's on pins and needles because they want everything to be perfect. And when something doesn't go perfect, and oh, you know, you can get out of, been out of shape. But the main thing is to celebrate the gift of life and the bringing together of people for marriage and for the blessing of family. That's a beautiful thing. And so this power of God that Paul needs, it leads me to talk about the church, to talk about the body of Christ and how we need the church. We need each other as encouragement and as a witness unto God in the world. We need the church. We need the whole church to receive the gospel. First of all, that we need the church to receive the gospel. That we receive it. We read the Bible together. We're not just as individuals who go out and buy a Bible and, you know, figure out everything as if, you know, I went to heaven and circled the throne and took pictures and I'm now back to tell you how it all is. No, we read this word together and we interpret it together. And we might have different opinions about what the Bible says. And so there, we, there goes God again, right? Having us work together to receive, to receive His Word. Secondly, we, are, we need the church to be blessed and encouraged, encouraged in love and acceptance and redemption. Redemption. Do we believe that? Do we believe that the church is a place for redemption? This, I've got my mic here. Is this on? Is this on? I, I've got two visuals here. Of course, you've seen this. This is your baptismal font. It's, it was over there. I put it over here just so I wanted to, to say that the, the church has the sacraments. And we need baptism. There was, a, there was a, a minister who had fallen out of grace and he had done something and he was going to be dismissed from the ministry. And this bishop, Bishop Carter, in fact, the one who's retired, the Memphis Conference where I grew up, and he said, the minister sat across from the bishop and said, Bishop, you can't take my ordination away from me. That's all I am. That's all I have. And Bishop Carter said, I want to tell you something, brother. God loves you. I love you. And your identity is in your baptism. And nobody can take that away from you. Our identity is in our baptism. Again, not our strength, but his. God's strength working through us. When we plunge through the waters, well... Maybe not as a Methodist, we don't plunge through the water. You can, but normally not in this. But when we plunge through the waters, 
And we receive the blessing of God as children of God, an identity in Christ. We are His from a bit little baby on to adulthood and on to the end. Also, the, the chalice. The chalice is the cup, the cup of blessing. We need the Eucharist. You know, John Wesley said, I need the Eucharist. I can't sit in my pew like the quietists of the 18th century. The quietists were, the, they were, they were Lutheran pie, piety folk, and they were, they were deeply passionate and deeply faithful, and they impressed Wesley so much. But they said, you just have to sit there until you have the fullness of faith, and then you can come to the communion table. Wesley said, I can't do that. I, he would sit there in the pew, and he said, I have to come up to the table to receive the blessing so that then I can go forth and be redeemed. I need to come forth. It was just a difference in personality, per se, but that's why he called it the open table, so that even those who weren't quite sure, those who were baptized, but those who weren't quite sure of their faith, they come forth for the assurance of faith. And I remember... A time when I had Holy Communion that meant so much to me when I was scared to death. I was afraid. It was back, gosh, 22 years ago when I was doing a ministry in downtown Memphis, Tennessee for part of my ordination. And Bishop Carter, again, had his ordinands uh, go through a week of immersion, again, there you go, Methodist being immersed, in homeless ministry in downtown Memphis. So we were going to spend a whole week in Memphis in homeless-like shelter conditions. We were going to sleep like with the homeless and like the homeless. We were going to eat with the homeless and like the homeless. Whatever they ate, we would eat. We were going to dress down. We were going to have much less than we normally had. They even told us to make sure we park our cars in the gated area there so the cars wouldn't get stolen. Of course, it's downtown Memphis, one of the highest crime areas in the country. And I was afraid. I was 25 years old, 26. And I remember Brother Clark. Brother Clark, whom I knew, his father was our minister back home. He came, and he was a minister, and he had Holy Communion with us. It was a simple service. But I just remember, Lord, I need your presence for this week. I don't want to be here, really, but I need your presence. And, I, and that, that Holy Communion experience meant so much to me. And I drew close to God, and I was empowered, and I was assured for what was ahead that week. And so I think we need the church. Paul knows we need the church. Baptism, Holy Communion, all the sacraments. For this life is difficult. It's a struggle. God even says that the, the struggle of life is part of, our, part, part of our punishment. Genesis chapter 1 and 2. That it's part of our punishment for sin. Genesis 3, where he says, by the toil of your, of, your, of your life and the sweat of your brow, you will bring forth your food. God made it this way in the light of sin to check our pride and to remind us that we need forgiveness every day, but only through God's redemptive plan through Christ our Lord. And so we do all of this in the strength that God gives us, this extraordinary power. Paul could live out the gospel. Paul could say, I stand before you as a sinner saved by grace, not by his own wit, not by his own strength, but by this extraordinary power that lives within us. 
so that even if our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, the early Christians observed with great devotion the days of our Passion and Lord's Resurrection, and it became the custom of the church that before Easter there would be a 40-day season, time to enter into spiritual preparation, and during this season the converts to the faith would be prepared for holy baptism. It was also a time when persons who had committed serious sins and had separated themselves from the community of faith would be reconciled by penance and forgiveness and restored to participation in the life of the church. In this way, the whole congregation was reminded of the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the need we all have to renew our faith. I invite you, therefore, in the name of the church, to observe a holy Lent by self-examination and repentance, by prayer and fasting and self-denial, by reading and meditating on God's holy word to make a right beginning of repentance. And as a mark of our mortal nature, we come before our creator and our Redeemer. Beloved, we prepare our hearts and minds for this time of the imposition of ashes. I'll ask Pastor Judson if he will assist and invite you as we get ready to come forward. We can put ashes on your forehead and also, if, or if you would choose, on your hand to remember our own mortality and put on God's immortality. And we give thanks for the gift of the cross and journey to the cross in this season of Holy Lent. Beloved, let us come forward for this time to receive ashes as a means of grace. Remember the
Beloved, let us stand and give thanks to our Lord Almighty, being reminded of this journey that we take these 40 days singing together, Lord, who throughout these 40 days, and we'll sing together verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. Let us stand and sing. receive these words of assurance. May the almighty and merciful God who desires not the death of a sinner, but that we turn from our wickedness and live, accept our repentance, forgive our sins, and restore us by the Holy Spirit to the newness of life. Let's join in prayer as we share together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us remain standing as we sing together our final hymn, Just As I Am, <coughs> singing together verses 1, 2, 3, and 6.
Go forth knowing that Christ gives you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, to take up your cross and follow him. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. In Jesus' name, amen.